Hello, it's the Trappings and Trinkets Knitting Podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole. Look what I'm wearing. If you've watched the podcast in the past, you might remember that I've been knitting this sweater for quite a while. Not actively knitting it, but I got the idea for the sweater and started it, I don't know, three months ago or something like that. And then I started it two or three times and decided that I needed to, because I started just with like this rainbow mini skein pack. Um, it's the Love is Love pack by Dream and Color, and it's on their Cosette base. So I started just with the rainbow pack, and then I thought, well, I'll do the rainbow pack all the way up the body, and then I'll get some dark gray or black for the sleeve and top of the yoke area. So as I started working on the body, it quickly became apparent that I was not going to have enough to make it the length that I wanted. So um, I decided to wait for the dark yarn order that I had placed to come in so that I could add these little stripes of black throughout the body in between each of the colors and that would stretch that color pack out so that I could make it longer. I actually probably just started this about two weeks ago <laughs> for, for this final attempt and it turned out so well. So this is the Calla Luna pattern and um, like I already said it was the Cosette base from Dream and Color that's a DK weight. It's an MCN yarn. It's really soft. It's really cozy. I could not wait to wear it today. It's, it's just as comfortable as I was hoping it would be and it did that magic thing. You know how you know, you do all your measurements, you do your swatching, you, you count the rows, you think that you have it the right size, the right length, and then, but of course, before you wash it, it's not really exactly the right size. So then you wash it, and then you take it off the blocking table in the morning, and it's like that magic thing that happens with blocking, like everything just gets right into the correct place. I was a little concerned about the sleeves, because this, this, um, yarn does block out a little bit it lengthens um and the sleeves were you know they were a little on the short side they were kind of like this pre-blocking just above my wrist and because it's like a bell sleeve it's a you know it's a loose sleeve i didn't want it to be a like a shorty sleeve because this is a tunic style so i thought that would look weird with a long sweater and little short sleeves so I was so glad to see them lengthen and they kind of go right over my wrist which is exactly where I wanted them um, the bottom of it hits right below my butt which is what I wanted because I wanted to be able to wear it with leggings or tighter jeans so I was just thrilled to get it off the blocking table um, another note about blocking I was before I blocked it the top so this stripe right here cut right across the like the fullest part of my chest and I hate that I I don't like it when boobs are cut like right in half so I was very glad after I blocked it to see that that part like fell firmly into one of the color bands so that's another just little tip if you ever have a, um, a color design or stripes on the chest of your sweater um, and you're a female. <laughs> I guess this probably doesn't uh, apply the same way to men. But for a female sweater, um, don't put it so that it's like right across the middle part. Um, it looks a lot better if those stripes are hit above and below. Now, obviously, because this is like big stripe, little stripe, big stripe, little, <laughs> little stripe, it's the little stripes that I was concerned about cutting right in the middle of there. So I'm glad that the, the bigger stripe ended up in that spot. So there you go. Tips for you. <laughs> so have you been watching all the Rhinebeck videos? That's what I've been doing this week while I was finishing the sweater is catching up on everyone's Rhinebeck experience. That's one of those bucket list things for me. I would love to go to Rhinebeck, but I live in Illinois and that's in New York. And also the timing is not great because of 
the whole marching band groupy thing. That's just the season of life I'm in. I have to kind of stick around town for most of the fall because of marching band. So, you know, in the future, I'll have a little more freedom. Maybe I'll get to go to Rhinebeck. Um, but it's been really fun to watch everybody's videos. And um, let's see, I got to see Christy Glasses' Tell Me About Your Rhinebeck Sweater video. That was uh, fun to see every what everybody made. Um, she also did a little interview with the grocery girls and the Espas Trico um, ladies, so that was fun. Bullen Vine, I think, did a, a Rhinebeck recap. And also the grocery, I think I watched the grocery girls, their, their own podcast. They did a, a recap of grocery, of Rhinebeck. By the way, they said they'd stick to an hour. They're like me. They can't stick to an hour. <laughs> This, I have to leave to go to the doctor in like 45 minutes. So I know I'm going to have to stick to under an hour today. And also like, I feel like my list is not that long that I have to talk about today. So, so that means it'll be just over an hour, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, it's been really fun to live vicariously through everybody and see what was going on. It looks like they had, well, really beautiful weather for the festival this year. Uh, I feel like it was just last year that there was snow so it was a much different environment this year, but uh, I felt a little bit bad for everybody that knit themselves a new sweater and they couldn't even wear it because it was like 75 or 80 degrees out. So not, uh, not very wooly weather, but very nice if you have to be outside. <laughs> I'd much rather be a little warm than be freezing cold. Speaking of retreats, I'm looking forward to the um, Knitting Pipeline retreat. That's going to be in February this year. If you are in Illinois or can get yourself to Illinois. There's a um, knitting retreat in Washington, Illinois. Um, it's held at a church. It starts Friday, I think usually around four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we go it, pretty much as late as you want to stay on Friday. They lock the doors at like nine or 10. So you can leave after that time, but you just can't get back in. Um, and then Saturday morning, people wake up. I think they're back over at the church by eight-ish. And then um, usually it wraps up around four o'clock or so Saturday afternoon. Um, so it's like a day and a half retreat, which I mean, really, I feel like that's a really good amount of time. You know, you just get to sit and relax and knit and talk to other people who have, you know, similar interests and you get to see what they're making. She always makes an effort to have some classes and workshops. Um, in the past, I've gone to, like last year, she had a needle tasting. That was really fun. Um, a bunch of different types of needles laid out on some tables. She must have had 40 pairs. Um, so, you know, she just had each one were cast on with a few stitches. You could knit a few stitches with each needle. And then she had a little paper for everybody to write down what they thought of that needle. So it was like, rate it one to five stars and then if you have any comments so um i got to do that and i and basically that just reinforced me that i love metal needles um i i hate plastic and acrylic needles those are just not my they are not my jam um and i i used to use bamboo needles a little bit the more i get into knitting the less i like bamboo needles just because i love the slick pointy fast. The metal needles feel comfortable in my hands. So that's just, I have a strong preference for that. Um, I was interested though, she had some of the, um, I want to say they're Harbin's needles. They were a little bit heavier and I feel like they were square. Um, I, I haven't used any non-traditional shaped needles. Like I know that they, there are some made now that are hexagons or squares. I think, are there even triangles? Um, so I didn't like the, the square ones. Um, and I don't, I don't think it was just like, I just need to get used to them. I think it, that I just really, uh, prefer the rounded needle tips. Um, but it was really interesting to try them out, uh, there and being able to try out a number of different cord types. Um, I really like the red lace chow goo, the, like these cords, this is where it's at. I also really like the, um, older knit picks cords. They change their, where their cords are produced, I think, maybe five years ago or four years ago. Um, and their newer cords are a lot stiffer, but I still have some older cords in my kit. So I really like using those. I, even though I have a bunch of newer cords, I will still use the same two or three old cords that I have and ship those to all my different needle tips. So, um, 
because I just I prefer them that much over the new ones. I just don't even want to use the new ones. Like I basically use the new ones to hold projects if they're not being worked on <laughs> right now. So um, anyway, so the needle tasting was really cool. Um, she's done felting workshops. She's done, there was one like make your own dryer balls. Um, I went to a pie, sh or it was, maybe it wasn't necessarily a shawl class. I think it was just like the history of pie because her husband is a math professor um, at a local college here. So he was just talking about pie. And I think that they might have done that because I think that year the retreat was on pie day, March 14th. So, uh, you know, it was just kind of a fun thing. And I, I honestly, I went there so that I could have some trivia facts for my son, who is a math guy. So <laughs> I went there and wrote down some facts about pie. And of course, my son was unimpressed, but whatever. Now I know things about pie. Um, I, I actually taught one year a photography workshop. Um, I think it was more geared toward like, here's how to make your project pay or your project pictures better. <laughs> So I got to be one of the presenters one year. Um, there's been jewelry making uh, or like knitted jewelry. Um, I think they made like a beaded necklace. I didn't do that one, but I remember that happening. Um, so anyway, it's just a, a, a wide variety of little work classes and workshops. It's basically whatever the people who want to lead them want to do. <laughs> so if you're around and you want to, you have a great idea of a workshop you could lead, I'm sure Paula would want to talk to you. So I hope to see you there. Um, so she usually opens up the registration in early December. And I think I saw her post this year that she thinks it'll be available by, um, by Thanksgiving. So keep an eye out for that. If you want to participate, it's always a lot of fun. It's very inexpensive. She keeps the price really low for a knitting retreat. I want to say in the past, it's been like $75. So it's very inexpensive. Um, there, you know, that doesn't include any lodging, but that does include your meals, dinner Friday night, breakfast and lunch on Saturday. And then a lot of times this isn't included in the price, but a lot of times a group of us will also go out to dinner on Saturday night, um, at a local restaurant. So you can stay for that or, you know, people that live in the Midwest and want to get back on the road to get home Saturday night, they usually have to leave around four or five. So they don't always go out to dinner with us. But for people who are going to stay overnight anyway, or for people who live more locally, it's a fun extra thing that you can do. Um, but anyway, as far as knitting retreats go, the price is very reasonable and it's a lot of fun. There are also vendors. Um, a few local yarn shops always come and set up. Now, one yarn shop around here has closed in the past six months or so. So they won't be there, but there will be th two for sure, maybe three yarn shops. Um, and then there's always a vendor fair on Saturday afternoon. And those are makers who come and sell their yarn, their bags, stitch markers, um, spinning fiber, all that good stuff. So that just goes on for like an hour. They set up after lunch on Saturday. We all rush in and shop and buy everything we want. And then that's over. So um, just an extra little thing. So it's a lot of fun. You should come and join us. In the last podcast, I showed you the At The Game hat. That was like a minty green blue stocking cap with a, um, textured stripes. There was like a reverse stockinette and brioche stripes. So that was a new pattern release a couple weeks ago. I released a second pattern this week, and it's called the Stone Stacking Hat. So this one is vertical cables kind of rounded cables. And actually this is not done with a cable needle. This is just done with increases and decreases. So an easy uh, cabling situation. There's a pom-pom from my Etsy shop. This is one of the real soft minky, like, like this actually feels like fur. It's just, it's fake fur, but it, it really does feel like, um, you know, nice fur. This is not like plasticky plasticky acrylic, you know, some faux fur is like that. This is like really soft. Um, got a little trappings and trinkets tag on there. So this is the stone stacking hat and this is the second pattern in the hashtag squad hats uh, 
pattern ebook, which is it's eventually going to have four hat patterns in it, but right now there's only two, the at the game hat and the stone second hat. And then by the time you see this podcast, which will be early next week, this hat will either be released or maybe it's going to be released tomorrow. Um, but this one is called the Swirly Gig Hat. And this one, oh, I should have told you, this one, the stone stacking hat, is made of one skein of Aran Weight yarn. Um, I made it out of Quince & Company Osprey yarn, uh, but it didn't take the whole skein. And this Swirly Gig Hat is made out of stitched together fingering yarn. So this is a lightweight hat. Um, it's slouchy. At the back, it has a couple of tassels that kind of come out of the hole here at the top. A little decoration. Uh, it has a nice wide brim, and you could actually, if you wanted this to be more fitted, you can pull it over your face. <laughs> you could actually wear the brim up like this. So, excuse me. It still has a price tag on it from the craft fair last week. <laughs> There we go. All right, so you could put the brim up like so if you wanted to. And these gray tags are double-sided. Isn't that nice? So you see it on the front and on the back. So if you do that, it's going to fit more like just a beanie. But I like it slouchy. So this one, um, if you make the largest size, it will take most of the skein. I think this was the second to largest size, so like the adult small medium. Um, and it did not, like I had plenty left over to make the tassels, so I made them nice and fat. Um, if you don't want to buy a second skein and you want to make the largest size, then maybe you just end up with one tassel, or maybe you end up with two smaller tassels with the yarn, yarn that you have left over at the end. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of a flexible pattern that way. But anyway, this is a swirly gig hat. Oh, and you see the texture here. That's why it's called the swirly gig because it has some little lines that swirl around the hat. There's another one down there. They just kind of swirl all the way around. Um, it has a kind of a unique closure on the top. The crown decreases here. You actually only have one decrease row and then you're done. So it's not a traditional crown decrease as obviously you can see because it's so slouchy in the back. Uh, but this is a fun, fun lightweight hat. So, Swirly Gig, look for that out either today or tomorrow. And that'll also be added to the, um, the Squad Hats ebook if you're one of the first 50 people to order the ebook. And right now, I still have plenty left, so I'm not to that number yet. Um, I will send you either a gray tag, this is the double sided tag, or the brown tag. And by the way, if you have a preference of which one you really, really want, all you have to do is send me a Ravelry message right after you make your ebook purchase and say, I want the gray one or I want the brown one, and I will send you the one you want. Um, if you don't care, then don't worry about it. I'll just randomly pick one to send you, but I will send that to you in the mail. Um, and if you live in the United States, you'll get it just a few days after you buy the ebook. And if you live somewhere else, I don't know how long the mail takes to get from Illinois to wherever you live, but I will send it the, the, you know, the next day. So hopefully it won't be too much, too long. Um, but you can sew that to your, either one of the hats that you make from the ebook or to any other garment that you like. You could actually, you could put it on the, uh, the cuff of a sleeve. If you have a sweater pattern that you've made, um, you could put it on a, like a, the end of a scarf or on a shawl. Um, and you know, they say handmade with TNT and obviously I know I didn't make your hat, but if you made it with one of my patterns, then you made it with TNT. So I don't know. These, these little tags are very trendy right now. I see them on all of the commercially produced hats. So, and my daughter tells me that, that that's part of what makes the stone stacking hat very cool. Cause this was like, she never compliments the things that I knit, but when she saw this hat sitting out in the living room, she was like, oh, mom, that hat is very trendy. That, that, I would actually wear this. She would actually wear it. That, she never says that. <laughs> so part of what she thought was cool about it was that it had a tag. So if you want to be cool like the teenagers, be trendy, be on trend, that's how you do it.
today's little um, extra knitting lesson, um, I thought when I was knitting this sweater, I was cutting it really close. I was kind of, I was actually appalled at myself because I had ordered two skeins of this uh, black, dark, dark gray, blackish yarn. And um, it just, I guess it comes in groups of three. So my yarn shop owner who ordered it had three skeins there. And she's like, do you want me to put this extra skein away from you for you? And you can see if you need it. And I was like, no, I mean, I did the math and I think I'm only going to need two skeins. But then I thought about it and I was like, ah, but what if I'm wrong? And then I just thought, it's fine. If I have an extra skein of yarn in my stash, whatever. Like, I have so many extra skeins. So I was like, I'm just going to buy all three of them. Maybe I won't need it, but who cares? I'll use it for something else. So I only had, like, I bet my ball is this big that I had left over. It was tiny. I bet I only have eight grams left over, maybe 10 out of these three skeins. Three, like, 115 gram skeins, by the way. Like, they're bigger at skeins than regular. So that was kind of embarrassing that I was so far off. I don't know how I messed up the math that badly, but it was pretty bad. Um, but anyway, I was going to let you know, because I was cutting it so close and because I was nervous about the length of these sleeves, um, I actually ended up doing an extra little mathy thing that I thought might be handy if, you know, some other people maybe don't know exactly how to do it, and I would share. Oh, it looks like I, I have a little fuzz blob over there. All right, so here's how you do it. What happened was, I these are bottom-up sleeves, and they're sewn in, so the, this is not made with the body of the sweater. So I made the sleeve, I went all the way up to my underarm, I bound off some stitches here, and then I started doing the decreases to make the sleeve half triangular, right? If you look at the sleeve from the side, you can see that it goes this way, like each side goes in. And that's why the top of your shoulder is not like big and baggy, um, because if your sleeve was the same distance around as it is down here, then your sleeve would be super baggy at the top, and instead it actually kind of comes to a point. Yeah, see those seams? So that's where it's coming into a point. So anyway, I did the whole sleeve cap, and then I had just a little bit of yarn left. And um, I had already split the yarn into two equal groups before I started the two sleeves so that I knew, you know, I can use up this much yarn, but if I start to run low, I need to figure out a way to modify the sleeve so that I have enough for the second sleeve. So I think I had eight eight and a half grams left over after I had finished the sleeve cap. So because I wanted the sleeves to be a little bit longer, I thought, I don't want to waste these eight and a half grams. I want to put them back in so that it'll lengthen the sleeve a little bit more. So what I did was I pulled it back down to where the arm bind off happens, the, like the armhole bind off. And I did a little math. So here's what I did. I had actually weighed the yarn before I started the sleeve cap portion. And I knew that I was starting out with 34 and a half grams there. I also knew that my first round had 66 stitches. And because I'm decreasing every other row, each stitch count, it's gonna go 66 stitches for two rows, 64 stitches for two rows, 62 stitches for two rows, 60 stitches. So there's always, you're decreasing two stitches every other row. So it was easy for me to just write that down. I just wrote a list, 66 times two, 64 times two, 62 times two, and on and on and on until I got to, I think I had 12 stitches on the very top row. So I wrote down that list and then I used a calculator, just figured out how many stitches that is. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Let's say it's 2,800. So I had 2,800 stitches and because I had started out with 34 and a half grams and I had eight and a half grams left over, I knew that it took me 20 stick, 26 grams to make those 2,800 stitches. So I have those 2,800 stitches, and I'm going to divide that by the 26 grams, and that tells me that it that I can do 107 stitches with one gram of yarn. See where I'm going with this? 
So since I have eight and a half grams left, I take that 107 and I multiply it by, I just multiplied it by eight because I was afraid, I didn't want to cut it super, super close. Like I didn't want to come up three stitches short, right? So I just had that little half gram as an extra insurance. So if I multiply 107 by 8 grams, that tells me that I can make 856 more stitches, right? So because I know that my first row there at the bottom of the sleeve cap was 66 stitches, all I have to do is divide that 856 by 66, and that tells me I can still do almost 13, but let's say 12 rows. I can put in 12 more rows of 66 stitches. So that's what I did. So the bottom 12, actually, I think for my actual calculations, it turned out to be 11 rows. So I took 11 rows, just went back and forth, and then I started the decrease portion after that. So it actually worked really well. And because it was a sleeve cap, it makes it a little bit more complicated because there was a point where I was doing every fourth row because I needed to make the sleeve cap taller and not decrease every other row because I would have run out of stitches. So I had to take out six of those um, every four row decreases. That's probably, that's probably getting a little complicated for some of you. <laughs> but basically, um, because I was adding extra rows at the bottom, and remember, I still have to sew it into this sweater. My sweater, let's say it had 70 rows from the armpit to the top. When I added in those 11 rows, now I only have 59 rows left to do the decreases in. So I had to make sure that my every other row decreases are only going to cover 59 rows, which actually it worked out perfectly. So um, it all worked out really well. Um, that modification ended up giving me the sleeve length that I actually really wanted, so I was really happy about that. So. Um, the other, the other thing that did happen when I sewed in the sleeves, and I'll put my hair back so maybe you can see this a little bit. I'm not sure you can though because it's so dark. Um, the I actually ended up having to fudge the neckline a little bit, and you really, I'm actually pretty impressed by how much you can't see it. Um, when I sewed in the sleeve, the sleeve and the neckline did not exactly match up, and this happened on both sides. Um, so instead of taking that seam out and trying to do it again and trying to match it up differently, I just went, who cares? Let's just take the taller side, unbind it off, like take out the bind off, unravel a couple rows, and then once I get it to the right height, I just bound it off again. <laughs> so it did end up like my, my original points I, I think I only had two stitches left at each side on the front and the back. Um, so once I did my little modification magic, maybe I had four stitches or five, I don't really remember. Um, but as you can see, like it's, you really can't see it. Once you pick up for the neckline, it's very hard to notice that anything is different there. So it all worked out really well as far as I'm concerned. But so what I'm trying to say here is, don't worry about fudging. Like if, if something didn't match up exactly in the pattern, there's always a way. Just like, just make it, make it work, right? Is that what the Project Run Runway guy says? Just, there's always a way to make it work and you should never feel like, oh, I have to redo this whole thing. Like I'm not, once I've got that sleeve sewn in, I'm not doing that again. I'm just going to make it work. <laughs> so don't be afraid to do a little fudging. So now I only have one project cast on because I just finished this yesterday at like dinner time. Uh, I did cast on a new project last night. So mom, if you're watching this podcast, you have to turn the, you got to turn it off. So go find the remote, go, go over to dad's chair, get the remote. It's pro maybe it's in the cushion. Check out, check in the recliner cushion. It's in there. Or just go, go over to the wall, unplug the TV. Okay. This is your last chance, mom. I'm showing your pro I'm showing your Christmas present, so don't watch. All right, so this is what I'm making. Mom, turn off the TV. So when my mom was helping me with the craft fair, she was trying on some different styles of hats, and she found one that she really liked, but it just wasn't quite in her color. So 
she mentioned that that was something she might like for her handmade Christmas present. And that's like, that's great because I always ask my mom and sister, like, is there anything that you would want knitted? Cause they know they're going to get something knitted from me. So they might as well get something that they actually would use. Um, so this pattern is called the Hannah hat and it has a cable band that goes around and then there's a brim, like a brim that sticks out, not as far as a baseball cap, but just like a little newsboy cap brim. And then the top is kind of puffy. Well, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'll just put a picture in. So here's the Hannah hat. Um, and actually my mom, she has a gray winter coat and she mentioned that burgundy would be a good contrasting color to go with her coat. So actually this is gonna look exactly like the hat in the sample, <laughs> pretty much. Um, I, it's written for DK weight yarn. But I, I really wanted a extra soft yarn, so I ended up getting Pashmina, which is a wool, silk, and cashmere blend from Madeline Tosh. So this is very, very soft. Like I could wear this against my skin, and that would that would be no problem at all. So the cable band is very simple, and here's the really fun thing about this hat is I'm using a different. A, a yarn with a different gauge than the DK. Um, oh, by the way, I'm holding the pashmina double. Did I say that? So that makes it maybe as thick as the DK, but maybe it's even a little bit thicker. Um, and I, I did go down a needle size. I'm using a size four. I think the pattern says DK weight yarn and a size five needle. So it's, it's probably a pretty similar gauge, but I didn't even swatch. And here's why. Because when you use the um, this pattern, all you do is you knit this cable band until it is the circumference of the head that you want to fit. Ah. Um, and then you join it into a circle and then you pick up stitches around the top and that's how you knit the top of the hat. So it actually works out um, very easily. You don't have to do a lot of swatching or measuring. I did wash this last night because that way I know that I'm getting a true measurement on the band. Um, so when I knit the rest of the band today, um, I will measure this and then I'll count the rows for the remaining part of the band. Cause I think I want it to be about 20. My mom has a tiny baby head. So I think, I think her head was only like 20 and a half inches. So she is a tiny lady. Um, so I won't have to knit it too much longer, but that one is, uh, I expect that'll probably be done. Maybe tonight, I'm going to knit night tonight, so that'll give me some, a few solid hours of knitting or at the very latest tomorrow, but this will not be a long thing. And then I'm also thinking of doing the antler mittens for her. Um, those are a cable mitten. Um, so I got three skeins of pashmina, so I have a little extra yarn to play with. I thought I'd make her some sort of winter set. Um, mittens, this Hannah hat, and then because the Hannah hat is not really like a warm winter hat, I might actually make her a second, like more stocking cap because she does like to go on walks. And so the Hannah hat's not really going to keep her warm. <laughs> so I might make her a, a hat that actually will go over her ears and keep her warm. When I went to get the pashmina yarn, I had to pick up an extra skein because ugh, I love this yarn. So this is Leading Men Fiber Arts. It's their Diva base. And I just really thought this indigo color was gorgeous. It's, look, it's showing up a little bit purple on the screen. Um, it's, it has a little more blue in it in real life. Maybe, maybe that, that's kind of showing you a little bit better. It's not, it doesn't appear purpley. It, it, it really is the color of like dark wash blue jeans. Um, but I love this base because, so it's silk. Let's see, is it merino silk? Uh, yeah, super wash merino, 20% silk. Um, this is the Dames at Sea colorway, and it's 600 yards on a 150 gram skein. So it really, like, it doesn't look bigger than a 400. This is a 400 gram skein. This is a, sorry, 400 yard, 100 gram skein. This is a 150 gram skein, and it doesn't look any bigger, um, but there's just a lot of yarn packed in there. So I, I like it because you can make a whole shawl out of one skein. So I'm not exactly sure what I'm gonna make out of this, but maybe a shawl. I mean, it's not enough for a garment of any kind, but it's gorgeous. So I got that. That Those were both, the, the Pashmina and the um, the Diva were both from Le Moutin Rouge Knittery. 
in Bloomington. So um, I, I try as much as I can to buy yarn at my local yarn shop, which is the Fiber Universe in Peoria, because I love that shop. I love the owner. That's where I go, you know, that's where I go to knit night. Um, so I try to, you know, do my part to keep her open as much as possible. Um, but for this particular gift, I really needed burgundy yarn. And I also wanted it to be something very soft. Like I really wanted it to be a luxury fiber. Um, and they're just, she just didn't happen to have anything in stock. So I was over in Bloomington this week, so I stopped by there. Um, and I really like her, you know, this yarn shop is great too. She has some very luxurious yarns, um, some things that I just can't get in Peoria. So um, I do go over there every once in a while for like an extra little treat, treat yourself yarn shopping. <laughs> but um, the Fiber Universe, talking about that shop, her, I want to say sixth anniversary maybe it was five but I think it was six I think she's been open for six years so every November she has a, a anniversary week and she always does specials every day she sends an email out every day and tells you what the special is this year so in the past um, it's always been like we're introducing this new yarn to the shop and today it's this much percent off so that's it's always fun to wake up every morning and see like oh she's going to carry this yarn now. So that's always been neat. Um, this year, she decided not to save all of her new yarns for introduction over that anniversary week. Instead, she just, she's actually had gotten a lot of new yarns just over the past few months. She's always uh, changing things up in the shop. Um, but this, this year, she just chose different yarns to feature. So um, one day, actually, it was funny because I was thinking to myself, I think one day she's going to do some hand dyed fingering yarns, but, um, it came to be Thursday and that just happened to be the day I was there. And I wanted to get a couple things because she, she also does a bubble gum discount where you have a bubble gum machine and you turn the little thing to get your gumball out and whatever color the gumball is, that's the discount that you get on the yarn that you're buying. So I mean, I have to buy something because she's giving us a sale. So um, because I loved the stitch together fingering yarn so much, I actually made two of my hats from this ebook are made from stitch together fingering yarn. Um, it was this one and the at the game hat. Actually, this is exactly the color that I made the at the game hat from. Um, and I liked it so much. I thought I'll just get it and maybe I'll make something else from it. Uh, that one's called Brain Freeze. So this is stitched together and it's called like smooth, yeah, smooth, stitch, smooth sock. This is a 75-25 merino nylon hand dye. Um, and then the other color that I liked was Radioactive Ooze. Oops, that's coming out a little bit washed out under the light. So I guess both of these are a little more saturated than they appear on screen, but I got those two hand dye uh, skeins just for just for funsies. Last but not least, I thought I'd tell you about um, a couple of podcasts that I've been getting into lately. Um, a woman from my knit night has been talking about this pair of knitting men called Arna and Carlos. They have um, a lot of video podcasts, and I guess they used to be um, – fashion like they machine they would design knitwear for machine knitting um for fashion houses like they would it, it would be sold at department stores all around the world so they used to do that but now they write patterns and books for hand knitting um i think they're both norwegian um by ethnicity but one of them grew up in south america but now they both live back in norway um, so I've been checking out their podcast and I found it quite charming. And the other one is an audio podcast called On Being with Kristen Tippett. And this was another recommendation that I got at Knit Night from a different person. Um, I forgot what we were, I think we were talking about religion. That's how we kind of got on the subject of this podcast. And it's not, it's not a podcast that is focused on religion. There is a lot of conversations about God and religion and spirituality, um, but that's really only part of it. So don't be afraid of that, you know, you won't find anything in here for you because I, I really do find a lot of the stuff that she talks about very interesting and very relevant. So the format of this podcast 
is that she will have a guest and they'll have a conversation. Um, I like that she releases two versions of each podcast. There's always the unedited version and the edited version. So for people that I know I'm very interested in what they have to say, or if I read the description of that episode and it's a podcast that I think, oh, this sounds like a really interesting topic, I will listen to the unedited version. And that might be 40, 40 or 30 minutes longer than the edited version. Um, and then sometimes if it's someone that I'm just like, oh, I don't know how this will go, so I'll just listen to the edited version. Um, and there's been a couple that I've, I've listened to the edited version and I found it so interesting that I will go back and listen to the unedited version. So it really is a, a good podcast. Um, a couple of my favorites, the one that was recommended to me at Knit Night was her conversation with Martin Sheen. Um, we, my husband and I have been watching uh, The West Wing. We watched it for the first time, um, kind of in the middle. Uh, I think it was actually after the 2000, uh, I don't remember. It was somewhere in George Bush's presidency. Um, we didn't like how things were going and it was kind of an escape for us. Um, and about six months ago, we decided that we had a, a need for that sort of escape again. Um, so we've been watching The West Wing and so Martin Sheen plays the president in that um, series and it was really he had a lot of really interesting things to say I actually I listened to the unedited version and then I immediately told my husband like you would really like this I think that you should listen to this and he liked it a lot too so I would highly recommend that one um, she had a conversation on there with Brene Brown that I found very interesting I fully admit that I am a, a big fan of Brene Brown so you should listen to that one. And another one that I found very interesting was a conversation with Atul Gawande, or Gawande, Gawanda. I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. He's an author. Um, he's a surgeon and also an author. I was familiar with him from his books. Um, there was one called, I want to say it's like The Checklist Manifesto, and then a more recent book called um, Being Mortal. Yeah, Being Mortal. Um, and that one is kind of the... Oh, so the, the checklist manifesto, um, that has a lot to do with um, like how mistakes are made during surgery and at hospitals and what can be done to make, minimize that happening. Um, and then the, uh, the Being Mortal book is about the end of life, um, how, how people do with hospice care, um, and kind of the choices that are made that people make or are made for them and how those affect their end of life experience. It's a really different way of looking at the end of life experience. Um, not, not the typical American way. Um, so if you have any interest there, I would highly recommend though that book particularly, and definitely the on being podcast that features the conversation with a tool Gwanda. So that's what I've been up to lately. Just listen to podcasts, watching some video podcasts, watching some West Wing, releasing some hat patterns, um, finishing up my sweater. All right. I think I've got it all. That's my whole list. And look at this. I still have 15 minutes before I have to leave. I did so well. It's only 53 minutes. I'm, I'm going to edit this down to like 51 minutes. <laughs> Oh, it's a couple days later. I realized that when I recorded the podcast, I forgot that a very important event was going to start before um, the podcast after this one would be published. In fact, it's going to start tomorrow because I'm, I'm hoping I publish this on Monday. So it's going to start on Tuesday. If I publish this on Tuesday and I'm a little late, it starts today. <laughs> what I'm talking about is the Indie Design Gift Along. And if you haven't heard of it, this is, I think, the fourth year that we've done it. Um, it's a lot of fun. It involves a sale. It involves knit-alongs. It involves games and prizes and all sorts of good things. So here's what you need to do if you want to be a part of it. Um, you go on Ravelry to the Forums tab and you, go, or you, you search the Indie Design Gift Along. You go to that forum and there you're going to find a thread that has all the participating designers. It's going to have links to all of their Ravelry pattern collection pages. And on each individual designer's page, they're going to show you a bundle 
at the like so you're gonna have a bunch of patterns but above all the single patterns you're gonna have bundles so one of those bundles is going to say gift along 2017 so you're gonna look for the bundle that says gift along 2017 and that's going to show you somewhere between 5 and 20 patterns that that designer has put on sale now the sale starts tomorrow uh, Tuesday November 28th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time so I'm in Illinois so it's gonna start at 7 p.m. Central Time right that's how that works yeah okay <laughs> so 7 p.m. and that sale is gonna be 25% off of all of the patterns that are in that bundle there is a code and I'm gonna put it on the screen because I can't remember exactly what it is offhand but it's a very simple code and it works for all of the sale patterns for every single participating designer so you can buy as many of those patterns as you as you want you don't have to knit them during the time that you're um, that the gift along is going on you can stock up buy patterns for the year if you want to but you can use that that code as many times as you want for all of the patterns that are in those bundles now here's the thing um, you want to go to the Indie Design Gift Along forum and join some of the knit alongs because that's part of the fun of being in this gift along. So in the knit alongs, there's, um, there's going to be someone moderating or a couple people moderating each of the knit alongs and there's going to be a shawl knit along and a hat and a cowl and a scarf and a sweater and a baby item and a home item. Just anything that you want to make, there's going to be a knit along specifically for that. So you go in the knit along, you say, hey, I want to knit the World War G loves from uh, Coley 75, Trappings and Trinkets. So you put your pattern that you want to knit in there and they sign you up and then you're a part of that knit along. So maybe there's someone else knitting those same fingerless mitts or maybe there's other people knitting lots of other designers fingerless mittens. And so you get to follow along and see their progress and get a little encouragement along the way. There are games that happen within the knit alongs and some of them are the moderator will post some sort of question it'll be you know something about a participating designer or a pattern that is being featured or something like that or it might just be the moderator popping the moderator popping in and saying the next person to post is going to get a prize so i wrote down some of the prizes because i've seen the prize thread and there's some good prizes in there so you can win Let's see, they've got free ebooks, free yarn, free project bags, books, knitting books, crochet books. Uh, there's sets of stitch markers. I've seen kits with yarn that goes with a pattern. Um, there's shawl pins in there. There's sock blanks in there. And then there's a ton of single use pattern codes. And those aren't just good for the sale, um, the, the featured sale patterns that are in the bundles those are good for any of the patterns for any of the participating designers so there's a lot of cool prizes that you can win you can use this as a way to stay motivated for your holiday knitting you can use it as just a fun thing to knit something for yourself take a little break from all the craziness of the holiday but it's always a lot of fun um, I have participated for the last two years for sure maybe it was the last three years and every year I knit something by a different designer so um, some years I think I have knit gifts. I remember knitting a cowl for my sister one of the years. Um, last year, the one I remember most is a pair of colorwork mittens that I did for myself. Um, and I've taken advantage of the 25% off sale to stock up on some patterns. So it's a lot of fun. It runs from Tuesday, November 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern Time until the end of the year. So December 31st at midnight. That's how long the knit alongs. Um, with the games and all of the, the uh, camaraderie. That's how long that all lasts. Remember, the sale only lasts for a week, though. So it starts November 21st, 8 p.m. Eastern, goes till November 28th, and it ends at midnight Eastern time. So um, there are tons of designers. They don't have the information out from this year yet, but I did find a, a photo that someone compiled with all the information from 2015. So two years ago, I can tell you that 335 independent designers participated um, from 30 countries. So that's a lot of patterns. Multiply that by, let's say, an average of... Actually, you know what? I think I've seen that the average designer has like 12 or 13 patterns on sale. So 
that is a lot of patterns. So well over 3,000 patterns. So get into the Indie Design Gift Along Forum at Ravelry. Check it out. Uh, find something to knit and come along for the ride. So remember, you don't just have to knit one of those sale patterns. You can knit any pattern from any participating designer. And if there's like a pattern that you already have in your library and that designer is in the list um, at the top of that Indie Design Gift Along Forum uh, message board and they're a designer that signed up, you can totally use that pattern that you already have. So um, knit along with us and get your holiday knitting done. I hope to see you there. I'll definitely be knitting. I haven't, I haven't decided what it is yet, but uh, I'll definitely be there. <laughs> Actually, I know what it is. So the first thing I'm going to knit is a pair of fingerless gloves. So if you're in the fingerless gloves forum, you might see me there. So hope to see ya. All right. Take a look on Ravelry. You can find that stone stacking hat or that swirly gig hat pattern. That one, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Um, and then also, if you get the the Squad Hats ebook, you can um, you will just get the new patterns in your library. They'll just show up magically each time a pattern is released. It will just appear. There will be an update button on your library. So um, after the Swirly Gig pattern, there's one more hat, and then all four will be included in that ebook. So check it out. Let go ahead and. Uh, Get it so I can mail you one of my tags and then knit yourself some fun winter hats. All right. Have a great week. I'll see you later. Bye. Mm -hmm.